All right, let's talk about alternative hypotheses. Previously, we were talking about null hypotheses. That is the idea that your manipulation didn't cause a difference across your groups. And to simulate that idea in R, every time we run one of these simulations, what we did was we assumed that all of the data was coming from the same distribution. And to follow the assumptions of the ANOVA, we sampled data from a normal distribution right here. Say all of the values in this example are coming from the same normal distribution. So if we want to talk about alternative hypotheses, we're now talking about situations where independent variable does cause a difference. And that means in in terms of what we'd expect to see in the data, that we can we can think of our data being sampled in one group from a distribution that is different from the distribution in the other group. That's because the manipulation causes some difference. So we can no longer think of the data coming from the same distribution. So when our manipulation causes a change in the measurement, by definition, that should violate or break the IID assumption. Scores are no longer coming from identical distributions. They're coming from different distributions. So let's model that. What I've done here is imagined a kind of silly example. So we're, let's say we're measuring performance on a standardized test that has a mean of 100 and standard deviation of 25. We put people into four groups and we see if the kind of music that they listen to when they take the test influences performance on the test. And let's just imagine that listening to 1970s sitcom music actually does change performance. And what it does is it increases the mean for group one by a whole standard deviation by 25 relative to all the other ones. So, you know, if we put a hundred here in this data set, we'd be simulating the null that all of the data for all the groups is coming from the same distribution. But now we're breaking that assumption. We're saying that the data for group one comes from a different distribution with this parameter, a different mean. Uh, what we're declaring is a very specific alternative hypothesis. I've set up here that there, um, we're talking about simulating alternative hypotheses. It's worth recognizing that there's an infinity of possible ways that you could break the identical and independent distribution assumption. First of all, the mean that we think is here that's different from the other ones, this could be any number. That's an infinity of numbers. Similarly, any of these means could be any number. That would be another set of infinities. So there's an infinity of ways all these numbers could be different. We're really restricting ourselves here and only thinking about times when the manipulation causes a change in the mean. Manipulations can cause other things to change too. It's possible that it could change the variances. So that's a whole bunch more ways that things could be different. It's also possible that the manipulation changes the shape of the distribution, in which case we wouldn't, it wouldn't be appropriate to actually use these normal distributions here to describe uh, what's going on with the data. So this is all very sort of abstract and highly specific to this part particular way in which the distributions can be different across the groups. So with that in hand, let's nevertheless try to figure out what would happen in this kind of situation, you know, if this is what was going to happen. We can compute f values here too, and let's do that. Just like before, we're going to do it a thousand times. So it'd be like running this experiment a thousand times where on average the performance in group one is coming from this different distribution. So what kind of F values will we get here? I've plotted them in the alternative F distribution histogram. And we can compare that to the null. If all of those means were 100, this is you'd get this distribution here. When one of them is a whole standard div deviation different from the others, these are the kinds of F values you would get. Notice these F values are spread out, more spread out. They're also more positive. They tend to be larger than the ones in the null. And that's expected because under the null hypothesis, the means are you know not varying a whole lot because the means in each group are approximating the very same population mean. However, in the alternative hypothesis, the way we've set it up is these three means are kind of approximating the same thing, 100. This other mean, it's going to be approximating the 125. So it's going to be different. That means there's going to be more systematic differences between the group means when the alternative is true. And the F statistic picks that up. Typically you will get a bigger number on the top for your mean squared between than on the bottom. And that's why we're getting 
bigger numbers. Now, if we adopt the some kind of decision rule about when we would reject the idea that the difference we found was caused by chance alone. We could do things like where 95% of these values are smaller than this number. I used the QF function for that. I found that to be 3.23 for this design. So you might want to know um, how many times you would get an F value larger than 3.23 when you're simulating this alternative hypothesis. That is when there really is one group different by a one standard deviation, how often would you get an F value large enough that would allow you to reject the null hypothesis? You can kind of tell here if, if we just ballpark this, that's gotta be 2.5, threes around here-ish. So let's say the critical value is right here. Look up at this alternative distribution. How many F values are over here? Quite a few, right? How many F values are over here? Not as many. How many times would you reject the null hypothesis? Well, we could just say how many of the F values are bigger than this number? I found that to be 274. So there was a thousand independent simulations of the experiment and only 27% of them rejected the null hypothesis, which means that this experiment has low power. You'll only reject the null hypothesis 27% of the time, even when it's true that the, the there is a one group that's different. So just like with a t-test, you can improve the power of a design to detect a particular effect uh, by increasing the number of subjects in your sample. We can do that here. What I've done is just made it a random increase to 50. That's quite a, quite a bit more. Previously it was five people per group, now it's 50 per group. So what, what happens if we go all the way up to 50? We can redo the whole simulation. And now we, now we see a different alternative uh, distribution for the F values. It's much more spread out, it's very positive. We can also look at the appropriate null distribution here. The degrees of freedom are slightly different. Um, we still have four groups, so it's four minus one for the numerator. And we now have uh, 50 in each group, so that's a total of 200 minus four for the denominator degrees of freedom. So the critical value here is 2.65. We get a slightly smaller critical value, fine. We still have the question, how many of the F values in the alternative distribution would be greater than 2.65 if we had 50 subjects in each group? So the answer in this case was a thousand. The power here is a 100%. If you have an effect that is, you know, in some sense, pretty big. Like the first group is one standard deviation shifted from all the others. So four groups, you could put 50 people in each group. You're going to detect that effect 100% of the time, pretty close to 100% of the time, let's say. So this has high power. The problem with 100% is you don't know how much you're overshooting. So you might be highly overpowered. I mean, if you put a thousand people per group, that'd be 4,000 people, you'd still be at 100%, but you'd have uh, wasted all that uh, time and, and effort to run all those additional subjects in your experiment. So you'd be wasting people's time, yours and theirs, for little gain in the sensitivity of your design to detect the effect you're interested in. So another way to approach this is, how many people do I need to have a reasonable amount of power? So I know I could do 50 per group, but could I do less? Could I save some resources? One approach with the simulation we could take is just, let's just mess around with the value. So I did that in R. We could take a look at the messing around process. Here's the code. You know, I just changed the number from 50, put 40 in, press play. Let's see what happens. So I get 99% power. That's still really high. I could probably do less than 40. So I did 30 and, you know, get 98%. So these are all rough numbers. I put 25 <laughs> and then I think I did that a couple times and saw that it's getting close to 95%. So this is 97%. You do 25 again, you get 96%. This is, this is all kind of rough approximations. If you wanted a really nice precise estimate, uh, you could increase the number of simulations to 10,000 or 100,000. It'd take a little longer to get the number, but it, you'd be a little more, more confident in exactly the value if that was important. Another thing we could do is add a loop here in R. So I did that. So it's going to go and instead of me by hand changing the number of subjects per group, we can just have R do five, then 10, then 15, then 20, and so on. 
takes a little longer to do this because every time we're simulating 1,000 experiments with five subjects per group, then 1,000 experiments with 10 subjects per group, and on and on. Every time we calculate the power, which is the proportion of experiments out of a thousand that successfully rejected the null hypothesis. And let's take a look at that. I put the results in a table. These are the simulated power estimates for the different number of subjects. You can see as we increase the number of subjects, we increase the power to detect this effect. And we can plot a power curve just like this. And so, yeah, if you anticipated that your experiment would cause one group to have a mean shift of one standard deviation and the other three groups would be identical, and it was between subjects design, and all of your data were coming from normal distributions with the very same variance, that's a lot of assumptions, then these are the number of subjects you would need to achieve uh, powers of different rates. If you wanted to detect that effect with 80% power, looks like you could do that roughly with 15 subjects. If you wanted higher power, like 90%, maybe you need 20. This power curve is going to change uh, depending on what the actual alternative is. So if this mean difference is smaller, you'll need more subjects to detect a smaller effect. Remember, this is just one way in which these means could be different. All of the means could be different. That would be even more differences, potentially, and that would change the power curve. It's complicated to think about a general idea of power here because there's so many different alternative hypotheses and every single one has their own power curve. Nevertheless, if you wanted to do some really kind of general tinkering, we could do that. And the way I've done that here is, let's consider a practical question. Let's say you're interested in developing learning interventions to help students. And you happen to be uh, working in a domain where there's a pretty good standardized test of knowledge in some domain. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna give people a learning intervention and see if they do better on the test. And you're gonna try out lots of different learning interventions. You're gonna be creative. So group one will do one thing, group two will do another thing. You're trying different stuff out. What you're really interested in discovering are learning interventions that really help students on the test. Well, if you run a lot of people in every group, you'll be able to create designs that will be sensitive to really small effects. But you might not be interested in that as a researcher. Like, let's say there was some learning in intervention that caused change uh, in people's test scores by this really tiny amount, right? Would you care about that? From a practical point of view, you might, let's say you don't care. So you're not interested in having a design that's powerful enough to detect really, really small effects like that. But you want to make sure your design is powerful enough to detect, you know, like that's, this is kind of the question, like to detect what? Well, you have to make some decisions. And I just want to, this is not an example of good decision-making. This is just an example of some considerations and some of the challenges with thinking about this stuff. Let's say you decided that you were interested in things that would cause at least a 0.2 standard deviation shift. Um, it's not a huge difference in the test score, but let's say you're, you're trying to figure out if your learning interventions will, you know, if you can find one that shifts scores up by 0.2 for real consistently by that much, you might take that example and try to refine it and figure out why it's shifting performance up and maybe you can make it better so that it consistently shifts performance up even more. You wanna have a design that can detect things that are maybe around 0.2 shifts. If you're trying stuff out, you don't really know which group's going to have that shift. You don't really know what your groups are doing at all uh, in terms of the kinds of mean differences that would be created. That's okay. What we can do here is consider some kind of general power analysis with some kind of like minimum effect size or something. Now what I've got is four groups. We're gonna try this over different numbers of subjects because one of the questions we have is like, how many people do we need in each group? If we were simulating the null hypothesis, what we would do is we would have, let's say zeros 
in this parameter. That's the mean parameter for the normal distribution because we'd assume that every group is going to be randomly sampling numbers from the same distribution. Let's consider this alternative. So I've, I've programmed a different kind of alternative here. For each mean value, so this, this would normally be a zero for the null, but um, notice I've got a normal distribution that samples one value from a mean, or from a distribution with a mean zero and a standard deviation of 0.2. So that means the mean for this group is going to have some variability. Every time I run the simulation, it's going to pick a number and it's going to be around zero <laughs> with a standard deviation of 0.2. This group will also pick a different mean and so will this group and so will this group. So when we're generating our scores under this alternative hypothesis, every group, I think, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is every group will take its values from a different normal distribution on average, because the mean parameter will randomly be different. And every group will, uh, the group means will be different by about 0.2 standard deviations, which is what we're interested in up here. So this is reflecting a lot of uncertainty in the design. You don't know which group will have a big difference in the mean. You just think that there could be these kinds of differences. And you want to make sure that your design could detect differences that are at least this big. So we could do this and simulate the alternative hypothesis for different numbers of subjects in each group. And then every time, see how many experiments would reject the, the null hypothesis based on the critical value for F. So I did that. We, we're going to, it, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These are eight sets of a thousand experiments, each with different numbers of subjects. Let's take a look at the power curve. Here it is. What we can see is uh, we need quite a few subjects in this particular design to achieve reasonably high power. A lot of times 80% is chosen as a reasonable amount of power which means that 80% of the time you'll reject a null hypothesis when the effect is there. And to get 80% here, we're looking at around 160 subjects per group. In that situation, if we put 160 subjects in each group, you would tend to reject the null hypothesis when the average differences between the groups are about 0.2 standard deviations. Yeah, so th this is a way to start thinking about uh, how you can declare the kind of alternative hypothesis you're thinking about. And we talked about two different ways. One way is pretty straightforward where you have an idea that one group is going to be about a certain bigness different than the others. So you could just state that. Or you could go very general and think about um, average differences you might expect of maybe average sizes. Pretty clear that there's lots of different alternative hypotheses. Every single one has its own F distribution. And it does take some careful thought uh, to figure out which one's appropriate for your design. Uh, all right, so that's it for now. I have to add the questions for this lab. I'm gonna do that right away and we'll see you in class.